Welcome to Know Not Them, the podcast where Chris Brown and Mike Nichols breaks down the biggest news from the world of entertainment. And before you even think about it, no, we are not those Chris Brown and Mike Nichols. Contrary to popular belief or our listeners' concerns, we have no rights to their lives, no resemblance to their lives, and certainly no interests in their lives. We're just two catty gay men, one with sharp insights with a passion for all things entertainment, and one who thinks that the Kevin Costner film Waterworld was robbed during award season. But both are joined in a shared dream of making you laugh while spilling the tea on what they think is taking place in the entertainment industry. Like always, we will dive into the latest scandals, box office hits, and celebrity drama, all while poking fun at the industry struggling to stay hip in the age of TikTok. Because let's be real, Watching celebrities try to go viral on social media is like watching your grandparents attempt to use Snapchat filters. Let the madness commence. Michael, how are you? That was wild. Like, well, all right. I, yeah. <laughs> How's life? Um, it's been a month and a half. I know. And, and we've both been so insanely busy. This is like our first real time chatting and like actually chatting mm. since probably the last time we did this. Since the Oscars. I was doing Cinderella. Yeah. Since no, the Oscars. Af yeah, since the af after the Oscars. Yeah. Because we talked about after the Oscars and then I was in the midst of finishing Cinderella and then I got on the road and I was cabaret, doing all my You shit. on the road. I was running around. I was house sitting for my mother and then went to New York City. And then I, it's just been a spiral. So we were recording this in May. So this is our May episode that was supposed to come out at the beginning of May, but is now coming out at the end of the May. So yay, welcome to the No Not Them series of monthly shows where it comes out the first week of the month. But for this episode, it doesn't. <laughs> Rock and roll. But how else is life? How else is everything going? It seems like you just got back from New York. How was it? Uh, I, I, I can imagine uh, you took in a lot of theater, which for those who are listening, for those who have sent in questions, yes, we do get questions on the show. We will be asking some questions directly to Michael about Broadway and some of the things that are going on in Broadway right now. But how was sure. New York? New York was great. I really enjoyed it. Um we saw, my husband and I saw 14 shows while we were there, which is, of course, always an obscene amount. Um, and we had a really good time. We always go for his birthday in May. That seems to be the one consistent time of year that we go. Um, we are trying to get into every year for our birthday, going for a week for him, going for a week for me, which kind of coincides about six months apart to try and catch as many things as possible, alongside with going somewhat more regularly, just because it's... So there's stuff that was on Broadway that was there for a month and a half that was closing. So if we hadn't seen it when we saw it, we would have missed it. And it's just things move quickly. So <laughs> we uh, we really enjoyed doing that. And it was nice to also get away from work. <laughs> I was ready to jump off a roof. Said Allegedly. The, <laughs> I was going to say, it's, don't say that. The alleged uh, social worker who was supposed to be helping people. Let's not mention that. It was a rough month for every. I, April was rough. Like April is, just was not fun. I think across the board, like everyone I talked to, I don't know if it was like a full moon of something in retrograde, something in the microwave. I don't fucking know. No, it was just rough. Well, let's talk about rough things that were going on in the entertainment world for the last few months, few weeks, few since literally this since we last talked. Disney, Walt Disney, the great people who are in charge of Marvel Entertainment have been edging fans over the last few months, waiting for the title of the Agatha Darkhold series to officially be released. Uh, over the last few months, they have been telling uh, uh, their fans, the Marvel industry, that the upcoming Catherine Hearn, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing her last name wrongly, uh, the person who plays Agatha Darkness, Harkness from the hit uh, WandaVision, uh, was going to get her own spinoff show because the popularity of the character was going to be called Agatha and the Darkhold series. Then it was the Agatha and the Coven of Chaos. And then the third retitle, which came out literally about a month and a half ago was Agatha 
the Lion Witch with the Great Wardrobe, was finally right. renamed at the Disney upfronts as Agatha all along to sort of celebrate its uh, amazing uh, song that came out during WandaVision. Now, I've got some I got, I got some issues with this understandable it's a witch thing and it's going with the theme of what's going on in what agatha is all about uh but just be upfront with people like don't don't edge them along and try to make people get all excited for a title and then change it two weeks later and then change it two weeks later after that and then change it one more time and then change it once more like literally we're on this fourth iteration and i don't know if this is the actual name they say it's going to be its name but that's what they said at the very first introduction of this uh spinoff show so disney i just say stop it it's not good and it's very confusing for people who have bad memories like me so Michael, do you have any or thoughts? Or uh, it's or... very good marketing. Is it, do you think? Yeah. How That's so? That's really good marketing. Well, they, they announced the show 2020. Literally, and it's now yeah. 2020. Now it's now 2024. And everyone's been kind of sitting on their thumbs waiting. We, we can all be honest. We all forgot it, exi- it was existing. I forgot it. I loved it. I love Catherine Hahn. I oh. think that... It is an incredible, I think it was an incredible show. I really like WandaVision. I was excited for the spinoff. I love the cast, Joe Locke, Patti Lapone. You can't go wrong with the two of them also. But it's, it just, if we're going to be very honest, four years is a long time to go. So how do you get people excited about it? Drop a new title, drop a this, drop a that. Get some buzz around the show. Get people going, wait, is that it? What's happening? Like, the Lion Witch with the Great with the Great Wardrobe, incredible, iconic. I that was never going to be the title. It should <laughs> never was going to be. So it's it's one of those like it gets people talking about the show. It gets people talk excited for it. Gets some buzz for it. A lot of the Marvel TV shows have been kind of fizzling. Yeah. Um, I've stopped tuning in. I think we watched two episodes of this season two of Loki, and I haven't seen anything since that. Came and out. this year, this year is kind of a big year for Marvel because they have been trying to go through sort of a rebranding exercise with changing wh- who, what would be coming out, what would not be coming out. This year is kind of a big year for them because they now they have Deadpool and Wolverine, which the trailers have been yep. dropping and has been getting universal acclaim because it seems like Brian Reynolds can do no wrong in that role. And you bring back Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, you're going to get all the fanboys and fangirls coming out for that. So it's really exciting. Then you have Agatha coming out in august which i'm assuming there's going to be a lot of people who are excited for that because they love the character in wandavision so they might come back for that and then they have a third entity that will be coming out and it's only going to be from what i can see three entities this year which is sort of a kick kick back to originally what they started with in phase one and two of we're only going to do three movies a year and that's it because people are going to get tired and i think people were getting tired weren't they yeah, I mean, they were dropping how many TV shows that I feel like within the last four years, we've had about four movies a year and like five to six TV shows alongside it. And, and the quality is suffering because you're not working on it. You're not crafting it. You're not making it really strong and tight. And like nobody likes something that doesn't feel uh, fully formed. If it's half baked, it's just going to be half baked. It doesn't matter. You know, people are going to be, no matter what, people are going to be pissed because they're telling more stories of women heroes or heroes of color or making the decision to adapt them to be variations, either male, white male characters to be black or to be women or so on and so forth. Like it's, people are going to be pissed over that. But when you're losing the fans that like don't care about that, like I don't care about that there's no reason for me to go run to see a Marvel movie. It's going to be half baked. It's going to be on Disney plus in four months and I can watch it then. So um, I want to talk about the uh, movie industry, the theater industry. And I say movie theater industry. We're going to talk about the theater industry a little bit later, but I I want to just pick up on something you just said there, because here in Canada, we're seeing actual cineplexes actually closing down because nobody's going to them anymore. Like uh, before, like 10 years ago, you would see a cineplex every literally every like town or every other town or every community out like larger than 
5,000 people would have its own movie theater. Now you're seeing, even in my city of Calgary, you are seeing cineplexes potentially even lower their rates or even try to reduce the number of showings that they're doing because no one's going to the movie industry anymore. Are they in the States? Is that how it's happening? Like, do you see a lot of people wanting to go out and see these big budget films or are they just willing to wait for the movie to come on and streaming? It's just so expensive. And like none of the movies, like, cause I really wanted, I'm going to be so honest. I really wanted to see Godzilla King Kong, the new one. I like those. I liked the first one. It was trash. Didn't that oh, just come out? That just came out on Apple, didn't it? Did it not? But like, that's the thing. It's also coming out now because it's not doing well in theaters. People know, well, we can wait. I want to see it, but I don't need to see it that badly. So I'm like, cause that's the thing. Barbie and Oppenheimer did like a big push together to be like, you have to come see this in the theaters. Uh, Top Gun, people wanted to see it in the theaters. And it, it's it's one of those, like, unless it's something that feels like it's going to be fully crafted, feels like it's something that's going to be really thought out that, like, you need to see on the big screen or, like, is doing the buzz right, it, there's no, it's not worth it. Like, I, I don't, it's a lot of half-baked ideas. And that just seems to be, there's such a rush of we have to get this stuff thrown out and we have to get all this media created because, like, I miss the days you could see a move. The movie would play for two months and you could go see it. Like now it's, you get about a week and a half and if it doesn't do well, it's gone. Yeah. Well, and I think BZ, you, you harken back to the Barbie Oppenheimer thing from last year. I think that this year is going to be uh, Deadpool and Wolverine. I only say that is because you put those two names, Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman on a banner, you're going to get people coming out because a lot of people are coming out just to see what the comedy is going to be like the rated Rness of it and how it's going to play because a lot of fanboys have been wanting this for so long that they're finally going to be able to see it. So I can expect Deadpool. I'm going to just, I'm going to put a prediction on it. It's going to be probably the top grossing film of this year alone. That's my guess. Oh, I a hundred percent agree. And I think that mm -hmm. it's because you know, with that movie, you're going to get a thought out fully formed film. You're not going to get, a rushed Marvel movie thrown together. You're not going to get like a rushed, like big box office, whatever with like half-assed CGI. You're going to get something that's fully created, fully thought out. Ryan Reynolds takes his time between the movies to make sure the film and the script and everything are all gorgeously written and, and ribbon together like a beautiful package. Like that's part of why these movies do well. And, and that's part of what used to do well for Marvel it was like after Endgame, they had no fucking clue where they were going and like, just like, well, we're going to pump stuff out till we figure it out. Yeah. Um, I just want to talk about TJ Miller for a second, who was in the first two Deadpools, who uh, the fanboys came after him after he came out on a podcast and said that Ryan Reynolds was a nobody prior to Deadpool. And once he once Deadpool hit, he be, he basically got this huge ego and he's not the person people think he is. And everyone rushed to Ryan Reynolds defense. It seems like there are a few celebrities in the world that you can do that. I, I akin to like Taylor Swift and even uh, like, well, Taylor Swift being one of them, that if you say something negative, the fan base will come for you. Or even Beyonce, let's say that. Uh, but it, it's interesting to see that Ryan Reynolds holds gravitas in this society and people think that he's so revered, which he kind of is. He's a very big philanthropist, which you don't get that often that get that much, get that much often. Wow. I can speak properly, guys. I'm usually good at this. <laughs> OK, sure, so I'm just I'm just going to I'm just going to turn the page. Uh, so let's stop talking about Marvel for a few seconds and let's talk about a subject that I know you have wanted to talk about because you sent it to me and you were like, let's talk about it. And I was kind of pushing back on it. And I want you to take the lead on this because, you know, it was Agatha all along. But did he did it? Oh, did he? Yeah. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, the video footage came out of um, him assaulting Cassidy, and I don't, I don't know if y'all saw it making the rounds or if anybody saw it. Like, it was graphic. It was a lot. I would not recommend watching it. I, I think saw about half of a second or two seconds of it, and I, I was like, I turned to my husband and said, "You, you got to take that away from me. I, I don't, I can't. I don't want to watch this." Um, and then Diddy came forward and yeah. admitted it and said that was him in the video and was like. I, I hate it. The thing that really stuck out to me was he said, I hated myself then for doing it. And it's like, 
you you don't regret doing it in the moment because you were doing it. You regret that people found out and that is why you're giving this speech or else you wouldn't have carried on the way you have been carrying on with regards to Cassie and trying to, you know, make her out to be this villain. It just felt like a bad PR speech and that particular sentence stood out to me because it's like, dude, it, this is not even a good PR spin of it. Like I hated myself in the moment doing it. Okay, but you're doing it. Like that's it, that you didn't hate yourself. In the, you thought you were right and admit, like you can admit now, you know, I've been in anger management and blah, 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 blah. Do that spin, whatever. Cause I, I'm going to be very honest. I do not think he's done anger management. Maybe just throwing that out it. there. Yeah. yeah. So I just, it was one of those things that it kind of blew up while we were on vacation and I saw that and I went, Oh, 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 okay. It's, it's, this is, things are not looking good for Diddy. So, okay. So when you, so you and I had a back and forth on this and I think I was pissing you off a little bit on when I was back and forthing with you. I'm not wrong, but I, I think I, because I, I, I took the stance and correct me if I'm wrong. For those who are listening, you put it in comments. You can send me emails all you want. I, 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 I have this weird feeling. The entertainment industry in 2024 is not the canceled culture that it used to be. There is a lot of people who are making the rounds right now who did something horrible 5, 10 years, 15 years ago. I think of Kevin Spacey. We're seeing over the next last few weeks, people are coming out and saying Kevin Spacey should get another chance. He's been acquitted in the London courtroom. And we are seeing Harvey Weinstein actually get potentially getting out on parole or getting out of jail because he's decrepit. Uh, but that's just no, that's here nor there. And then there's people who like Diddy's music who might say, you know what? He did something wrong, but we can forgive them because we've forgiven everyone else in this world. Why can't we forgive Diddy for doing what he did? And I agree. What he did was horrible. His apology smacked of, I'm, I'm trying to do some great PR here and it's not turning out. It was basically like the Mila Kunis, Ashton Kutcher uh, apology after he they came out saying, we think Danny Matheson shouldn't go to jail because he raped people. Well, I'm sorry. The PR is horrible right now in Hollywood, and it's pretty disgusting when you look at the PR system that we have. The reason I say this is I I hope this guy doesn't make any more music, but I have this sneaky suspicion he will, and he will continue to make music, and he will continue to profit off the music, even though what he did was horrible. I don't think you agree with that statement. And I think you probably would disagree with my sentiment that what he did, well, I shouldn't say the sentiment that what he did was wrong. And I think you would agree with that. But yes. the sentiment that I think this is just going to be another thing that we're going to forget about in about six months and people are going to go, okay. Because look at Chris Brown, for God's sakes, my namesake, for God's sakes, is making music now. And he beat up Rihanna. And now people are like, well, okay, let's let's go back. Kelly Rowland at the I, I forget what uh, what award ceremony she was like. Let's let's give it up for Chris Brown because he's such a great musician. And everyone's like, yeah, okay, it's like okay. So we just have to wait six years and people will forget about abuse now. Sorry. Well, I think there, <laughs> I think there's allegedly more going on with Diddy. That's going to maybe make some of this stick. But again, like what's happening with Harvey Weinstein now is what's happened with what happened with Bill Cosby. Yep. Like it, it, it's, I'm in jail, I'm dying, and they just don't want to have this person die in jail because that's more paperwork for them. So like that aspect of it, like I get why that it's, it's it's stupid, mm -hmm. it's fucking stupid, but mm -hmm. it is what it is. Um, I think with Diddy, it, it's the fact that he ran, it, it, it might change a little bit of the narrative, but the fact that he ran and is can't be found right now is a little bit suspicious in my opinion yeah like there's a lot of stuff going on allegedly with diddy that like i think are going to be factored in especially the folks screaming about the epstein island stuff oh it's already been it's, uh, literally i saw that on facebook this i think it was yesterday or the day before about while diddy? I was in the yeah no it was it, they can they can find diddy after like six months and like press charges but they can't release a, a dossier for just just uh 
Jeffrey Espins, Espins Island after like how many years it's been on the record. So literally people are already making that connection that, oh, it's another person that they're trying to silence and Jeffrey Espins dead. So we don't need to silence him anymore. It, it's one of the like, because that's the thing. I, he's been allegedly accused of a lot of the same stuff that Epstein was doing. So it's it's I think and that's where it might stick stick if they can kind of get that proving and get that more widely pushed out. But like how many people, like you said, the music's great, whatever, like people did the same thing with Michael Jackson. There's been, there was how many accusations. It's like, no matter what, people have to make their own choice and people have to make their own decision with regards to cancellation, with regards to supporting, boycotting, et cetera. I personally will not listen to Diddy, R. Kelly, uh, 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 Michael Jackson's music, really, like things like that. But it also then comes down to, okay, I I, I <laughs> wasn't really listening to it before. Like Michael Jackson is probably the closest thing that I was really supportive and uh, not su- really support. I would say that I listened to, enjoyed the music of, et cetera. But I'm not really like going out and buying his music, streaming his music, yeah. playing it, listening to it, et cetera. I think the closest I will come in the coming years to doing anything involving Michael Jackson is the musical is coming through tour and I already, I bought a season ticket and it's just included in the seven shows that um, for my price. So it's like, I, I'm not even like directly seeking it out. Like, and that's the thing. If I'm not actively seeking it out, it's different. Now, if it was like a, you know, I was, it, let's say using a restaurant or, or not a restaurant, let's say tomorrow, someone I like Beyonce let's say Beyonce gets canceled tomorrow I, that might be a different conversation or Dolly Parton gets canceled tomorrow now I'm gonna have a different conversation because I do listen to a lot of Dolly and it, I listen to a lot of Beyonce it's like okay these are artists I listen to this is gonna ha- be a different conversation but also yeah. like at the end of the day it's not it, you need every single human being involved to make something like a boycott really work and getting that many people involved to actively make a dent is damn near impossible which is why boycotts usually fail no understandable i want to talk about a potential boycott that i did not see coming but started to make its rounds on the dark interweb literally i think about two weeks ago when the full trailer or the latest trailer for the movie dropped and that is for the musical wicket the first installment of the wicket which will be coming out later on this year there have been calls to boycott it because of the actress playing uh oh my god Oh, Cynthia Al- Revo Al- playing Alphaba. Yeah. Alphaba, yeah, there you go. Yeah, because she is older than the character that she should be, but it, she's that's also, not why they're boycotting. That's but I'm just going. I was I was leading up to that, but thanks. Go ahead, you take my that's thunder, not Michael. Why. I'm, I'm sorry. 20, Twenty six minutes, and I finally okay. Michael, if you want to talk about, it, I'll just sit over here and sip my water. No, no, I just I have seen Cynthia Arrivo perform many times. She is the best one for the job. And all these people that want to sit there and scream, well, why aren't you picking the best for the job? Blah, blah, blah. They did. Shut the fuck up. It's fine. It's literally about a green fucking bitch flying in the air with fucking flying ass monkeys casting magic spells. It's not that goddamn serious. So the other and issue- And y'all weren't that... going to see it anyways. Sorry, you go. So the other issue that they're, they're bringing up is the fact that it's being split into two movies. Now I know because I prior to this, I actually went back and listened to our episode where we talked about this when it was originally announced, these two uh, that were, and we talked about how James Corden better not be cast as Mr. Go. Um, you said that you had a concern about it being split into two movies. Do you still have that same concern about this being split into two movies and how it could potentially ruin the storyline and add things that were not traditionally in the book or even in the play? I mean, yes and no. Like, especially after listening to it, I get it. They want the emotional hit of ending the movie with defying gravity. They want that emotional hit because you go, you have intermission. After that song, you have 20, 30 minutes where you can, wow, oh my God, blah, 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 blah. I think the biggest thing they're going to run into is that like buzz is going to go, wow, wow, wow. Mm, The next movie's not out for a year. Like if it was boom. And then five months later, great. 
like do sort of like a july and then december release of both of them at the same time to say okay you don't have to wait that long by the time the first one comes out on streaming you'll be able to watch it then go back into watching in the theaters for the second one that's actually not a bad marketing ploy or like december and july because then you can get both oscar seasons which is why they're doing it oh is that why they're doing i 100 percent think because they can push because especially someone very familiar with Wicked, Alphabet's bigger in the first one. Glinda's bigger in the second one. So you can push Alphabet for the first one. You can put, or you can push Cynthia for the first one, push Ariana for the second one. You think that's what they're doing? A hundred percent. They're going for the most awards they can get. And I, they're going, also, it's a cash grab. People are going to, well, I saw the first one. I need to know how it ends. Like, or and I think, you know, there's enough the in the movie. There's enough in the, well, the book and the musical are different. I know, but you could just read the book. I read the book and I thought, eh, that's a boring book. But it's, it's to- the musicals, as someone who's read the book and seen the music, they're so, they're really yeah. very, very different. Um, and the movie's going to be a different thing also because it's going to blend the two. I'm, I'm curious. I'm very curious. I'm annoyed because we could just have a three hour movie. Oppenheimer did it. And on like in real talk, they used to do the movie musicals where they'd put an intermission into the fucking movie. For My fucking sakes, Gone with of- the Wind was fucking 12 hours and it had like 12 intermissions, it seemed like. <laughs> Sound of Music, my cop, my DVD copy of Sound of Music has a friggin' intermission, a 15-minute intermission in the in the film. It's like a three-hour, 45-minute film, and it has it right there. Like it's totally doable. And people, I think that would get people to see the movie. Like, wow, we're gonna have an intermission in it. And like that makes it that would get people excited. But it's just, it's it feels cash grabby. It feels like we can't give both. Cynthia and Ariana Grande best leading actress in a movie in the same year so who are we going to push for one and who are we going to maybe push for the other and I think this is the way they're doing it and, and I hate that that's the reality of it but like that's, it's all a game it's all a game plus at the same time just think about the marketing of DVDs and merchandise right buy the first movie and then you have to buy the second movie and then a year later oh you can buy a joint movie where you can get both movies in one and it's a special collector's tin and there's people out there who like that stuff uh marketing 101 in the entertainment 100%. industry is just crazy it's all marketing it's all it's all about the marketing baby <laughs> marketing all along it was the marketing. Oh, that's that's the title. That's the title. It was marketing all along. Um, I wanted to, I want you to talk about uh speaking of splits of movies, let's talk about splits in potential actors and actresses. Go for it. Woo! Benefer is on the outs, allegedly. Um, Matt Damon gave an interview where he is having to like distance himself from Ben and he doesn't like the way his best friend is being treated by Miss J Lo, and like all this drama and nonsense and madness. Or oh, are they going actually on the outs? Well, there uh, J- there was a whole blind item um, that came up on a couple of like those gossip websites about how a celebrity A list couple is not lasting two years because of um, irreparable differences and fighting and like all this chaos. And then J Lo has been on the Twitter liking. Um, people's like breakup posts, like really dramatic, like he's a fucking asshole and I hope his car burns. J-Lo's like this. Like people are like, okay, girly. Like, was it the movie? Is that what did it in? The greatest love story ever told? Is that- Geely? Geely? Is that what's causing this breakup? Because Ben did not want her to make it and she made it anyway. Like, it's just, it's unhinged. It's just unhinged, Miss J-Lo, Miss Jennifer from the block. Stop. But it, just again, stop. is this is is this just not marketing for her new movie Atlas? Is she doing another mo- new movie? Yeah, it's on Netflix like this week or next week or something like that. No, I don't think this is marketing for that. Because if it is, it's not very good marketing. I just think that Matt, well, Matt Damon and Ben um, had a whole issue the first time they dated. Ben and Matt broke up at their friendship for for years. And then came back together and then now it's happening all over again. And it's like, Ben, bros before hoes. Can we just talk? Can can he go back with Jennifer Gardner? They were a cute couple. 
I guess. I guess not. I guess not. Never mind, everyone. For those who are listening, watching this, uh, I don't remember to them together. I, I'm. I don't remember them they, together. I'm gonna be very real, real. Okay. Well, sorry. I'm um, sorry. Are you though? Are, are you sorry? No. Like J Lo from the block is sorry. <laughs> I'm still. I'm still Jenny from the block. Um. Uh, let's talk about what's upcoming. What are your sort of Netflix that you've been watching lately? I have really only seen The Bridgerton. The so new season. For those who were not on this call prior to us hitting the record button, I had mentioned I had never heard of this movie. I had mentioned that I'd never seen this. I had mentioned that I would never watch this because I just, I've only heard weird things about it I've, I've heard bad things about it i've heard good things about it but i've heard more bad things than good things from what? people who oh yeah i heard people who are like i can't watch it i got like two episodes in and i stopped watching i was like okay i respect your opinion so i'll stop watching it what but, that, but on the flip side they love the gilded age it, the Gilded Age has a little more urgency to it. There's a little bit more. The Gilded Age is more akin to like a Downton Abbey situation. Yeah. This is this is based on a romance novel series. So each season is based on a different one of the Bridgerton children's fall, deciding that it's their time to fall in love. Or in the instance of some, one of the daughters gets married, her husband dies, and then she and another book falls in love with a different man. So it's like, there's a cup like, and so it's really fun. It's and it's period and it's Regency time, but it's also like Shonda Rhimes and it's extremely diverse. And like, that's also a reason people get real mad because they're taking characters that are traditionally white and just saying, no, we're actually gonna reimagine this character as a girl from India, sorry. And like, it's just really fun. It's really great costuming. The sets are really great. It's just the, the sex scenes are fabulous. Like, it's just fun. I really like this. I'm really mad that Netflix split this into two parts. So I'm eagerly awaiting part two to come Which out. Comes because out? June Okay, so it's 14th, just recent. June 15th. Yeah, it's like a month. Like, it was like a month from when the first part came out. And it just, I'm like... That is, that makes me mad. That's because you just want your season to be on the number one for like the next month and a half, which it would have been anyways. Okay. You're just choosing to like split it that way. And it's dumb. Give me, give me all of it. I wanted to binge it all. I need to know what happens next. It's marketing all along. It is. And I'm mad. And I just, I, we waited two years for this season. Two. It's too many years. We waited four years for Agatha all along, so I think I, yeah, but I forgot that. about that. I never once forgot about Bridgerton. Okay, uh, Evil's coming out show. on Evil's coming out on Friday. I'm excited for oh, that. Oh yeah, like, season four finale. Season four, se series Three, finale four? season. Se series four. Season four. This is the final season, though. So last year they ended on a hmm. big cliffhanger and this is the fourth season that will be the final because uh, CBS is having hard times trying to sell it because no no one's watching it. But I'm excited for it. My husband has said, you're sitting down and watching with me on Friday and you're not telling, talking to anyone. You're putting your phone up and you're not going to leave anyone <laughs> on the, you're not going to talk or message anyone during the six hours that we're going to watch this because I think it's all coming out at once. Oh yeah. They're going all Hold out. On. I'm not 100% and it's sure. But... It's a long weekend for me. Hold on. Hold on. That girl. Hold. Uh, no, it's doing. Weeklies? It's doing the premiere. And then it's doing two episodes on the 30th of May. And then June 6th, June 13th, June 20th, June 27th, July 4th, July 11th, July 18th, July 25th. August 1st, August 8th, August 15th. Oh, they have 13 episodes. Okay. I thought it was only going to be a shorter season because they were. Okay. Maybe I, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I got my incorrect information. So guess I only have to sit there for an hour with my husband this weekend. Good. <laughs> um, oh, I'm, I'm excited. also have you, I, God, I came back to it. And I'm, I, this is going to shock you. RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars. What? Is that show still I'm watching. On? 
It just but it's they're doing the All Star Seven thing where nobody's going home. It's just, it's eight queens. Nobody goes home, and they're all they're all competing for charity. So they were all given fifty thousand dollars for outfits, things like that, to come on the show. Like it quite literally is. You're winning two hundred grand plus for charity. You're you're participating that way, um, and you got money to appear, appear on the show. So it a lot of they got a lot of very good queens. Like a lot of queens, people have been wanting. I did not know that this was the thing still. I thought that show had been canceled, to be honest. No, RuPaul Drag Race has been going on. I haven't seen, I did not watch season 16. I, I've i not been keeping up with any of the international, like UK, the world, Canada, the world. And I like those, but it's just, I didn't even finish this last season when Jimbo won because it literally was being pegged for Jimbo to win. And I didn't like oh, that. Yeah. Um, I love Jimbo and I, Jimbo could have won on her own merit, but like, it was very telling that they were just pushing Jimbo to the end versus letting Jimbo just do it naturally. Is what? it sad that I only know two of these names? Three of these Nina names? Nina West? That's the one. Nina, that's the first. Nina West, Got Mick, Roxy? and... Yeah, those are the three that I'm like, I don't know who the fuck these other ones are. Pardon my French for those who are listening. Miss Vanjie? Is that the Vanji Van girl? Okay. Vanji, Vanji. Uh, I mean, should I should, should I say is that uh, Brooklyn Heights ex boyfriend? Yes, that is Brooklyn Heights ex boyfriend. Okay. Yeah, there's okay. a lot of. Um, I might it's actually watch. I, we watched the first two episodes and we enjoyed it. It just I like when they do, my friend Anthony thinks differently. He wants them to send the bitches home. I like when they don't send people home. I. Th- find that I want to see and I want to watch their growth and like not everyone's going to be great at everything so give everybody this opportunity yeah the original seasons cut them out send them home goodbye Felicia there's too many girls but like this like an all-star season I want to see each queen with what they've done it sucks when you've been wanting a queen to come back be on the show and then they just get taken out in the first or second episode and it's like well, like Jiggly I was so excited to see Jiggly Caliente and her drag has gotten so much better but because the first two challenges one of them was sewing and she can't sew it's like y'all just brought her on to send her home and that's how they look at all stars is who can we bring on that people want but we can just send home because we don't actually want to win this time it feels like we brought people on like plastic tiara who can turn is amazing fr- looks. is there front runners roxy's probably gonna win i would be shocked if roxy didn't win which will make season five the first season to have all three of the final final three queens win an all-star season because alaska's won jinx has won and if roxy wins the the top three all will have won a season forgot about alaska alaska really yeah like i'm so tuned out of rupaul's drag race i feel like a bad gay (laughs) especially (laughs) on this the high holiest of months before the months of our people Oh, it's June. Everything's about to be homophobic. That's a minor inconvenience to me. I can't wait. Exactly. Exactly. Can't wait to hear Michael complain about all the uh, the inconveniences that he's been going through over the last few months. God, it's so humid. That's so homophobic during June. (laughs) Uh, I want to talk about one show that I have been binge watching lately. And I don't know if it's because I just missed it originally, but I've seemed to like it. And that's New Girl. I know it's over with. I know it's done. Zoe Deschanel, uh, Jake Johnson, I like them. I really do. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because I've been tied up in my house for the last few weeks and I haven't been able to do much. But I've been finding TV shows and New Girl. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. It's actually quite funny. That's my little rant there for a second. Uh, we got roll. one one last thing before we turn to the question part because that's right we have two questions for our illustrious theater critic slash entertainer and i want to talk about the flops of the movie industry lately so john krasinski uh, was wrote directed produced and starred in a uh, new movie that just was released literally i think last week or the week before called If, which is Imaginary Friends, which is If. It has a all-star cast, Ryan Reynolds in it, and it has Steve Carell in it as one of the main uh, imaginary friends. 
And in the first opening weekend, it bombed harder than freaking Oppenheimer on uh, D Day or D Day. That was a bad joke, Chris. That was a really <laughs> bad joke. <laughs> that was a really bad joke because Oppenheimer did not drop the bomb on D Day, but I will just let myself go. But Yes. Oh, okay. You had that look of, oh, you said something wrong. I just dropped. <laughs> I just don't remember what day it dropped. Um, so are people, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier on, but I want to go back to it for a second because I think this is a big thing that I think a lot, a lot of people are thinking about. Has the movie industry died? Has putting things in the theater died? Because a movie directed, written, produced, starring John Krasinski, Ryan Reynolds, and even Steve Carell, you think you would be able to bring people out to the movie theaters to watch that. But unfortunately, it bombed. It did not do well. And it's no one's like even the marketing was there. Ryan Reynolds did a great job trying to market it. It just seems like no one wants to see it. They want to go see these flashy movies like Marvel or Top Gun, and they don't want to see movies that are pet projects of people's. It looked terrible. I'm so sorry to the fans of that movie. It just looked terrible. It looked like for kids. Yeah, but even with Ryan Reynolds attached to it, like you think he would have been a little bit better. Like, we just have to start acknowledging, would that be real vicious? And I'm so sorry. Go for it. We just have to start acknowledging that not every idea we have is a good idea. Not every idea for a movie is a good idea. Not every idea for a TV show is a good idea. Not every idea for a musical or a book or a, a, a song is a good idea. And that maybe we should run it by people who are not yes men before before we dump tons of money into it. Right now you have people saying, I, I've read, like John Krasinski, wonderful man, brilliant actor. He's produced and written some great stuff going, I have this great play or this great uh, uh, movie. It's about imaginary friends and blah, 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 blah. And he's talking to his wife or he's talking to, who, to his, um, what's it called? Uh, his producers or his friends. And they're all, they're not gonna give him a real answer. Because he did well with A Quiet Place, right? He did well with A Quiet Place and Quiet Place 2, and then they span off into A Quiet Place Day 1 or whatever it's called. And people think that what he touches turns to gold because even Jack Ryan, Tom Clancy, uh, uh, the uh, the Amazon Prime show did extremely well. It just seems like everything else he seems to be touching right now is just not doing that well. I'm not trying to be rude there. Even his fine. wife, Emily Blunt, like the fall guy did horrible at the movie theaters as well with uh, Emily Blunt and Ryan Gosling. It just was a like did not do well box office wise. And people are just. I think we're going to see this is the season of flops, I think it kind of is akin to. Well, it, I feel like that's every year people release the movies that they're not as sure about between January and like. May, May, June, like maybe right before, like early June, because those are the movies that you are like, ah, it might do well, it might not do well. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Like these are the movies because people are it's winter, so people don't go out as much in places where it snows. Um, it's a way to put a movie out, and if it's a big hit, great, fantastic. But if it's not, well, we didn't put it in like a summer blockbuster slot or in like an Oscars time, uh, an Oscars film slot, which is what ends up being with like the fall. So it, I would say my, like one of the best movies that's come out of this time has been Argyle. I really liked it. I don't know why I had so much fun watching it. I went in knowing it was going to just be stupid. And the other thing, sometimes you just want like a stupid, fun spy movie that like is ripping on other spy movies. Speaking of that, I, did you, did you watch Unfrosted? What? Unfrosted, the Pop Tart movie with Jerry Seinfeld and uh, Melissa McCarthy. You didn't like no. that? I didn't watch it. I didn't know what existed, and that sounds unhinged. It is hilarious. There's a scene in it that has okay. everyone pissed off right now because it, like, it, it, 
it's the, the the climax of the entire movie and it basically is a shot for shot reenactment of the january 6th uh, attack on capitol <laughs> hilarious <sighs> i highly recommend it because just for that that's scene alone, a lot i enjoyed it I, I enjoyed it i i don't know what it was I, i'm a jerry seinfeld fan so what can i say but yeah i, I it's just this is a shitty time of year for movies Okay, so shitty it is. So let's turn to the question and answer. Harsh. <laughs> so I'm just pulling up the questions right now. So fill some time. Talk about talk among yourself. There, uh, talk Michael, among so we, myself. Yeah, so we don't have dead air. You want me to have an internal monologue about how I don't even know what to talk about at this point um what are the questions regarding like theater all about all about theater and i've got the first one up here right now perfect so this question is comes from s chemenka chemenka c c h e m e n c k hopefully i'm pronouncing that right to our listener or a follower or a viewer uh if not i do apologize s chemenka wants to know how does an off-broadway show become an on-broadway show Ooh, um, this, I love this question, actually. <laughs> so an off-Broadway show, let's use, for example, uh, Oh, Mary. Um, it was it's just finished its off-Broadway run, and it is now opening at the Lyceum Theater starting June 26th is when previews begin. Um, I only know that date off the top of my head because I'm very excited for Oh, Mary. Um, a lot of the times when producers look at a show and look at, okay, something's selling really well off Broadway. We think that we can get more money for this, or we think that we can bring it to a bigger audience. So let's bring it to on, let's find a Broadway house. So then they'll option it to the various theaters looking for a deal. So if there's a theater, let's say the Lyceum, the Majestic, and the Schoenfeld, let's say those three are empty right now. They'll, the producer of the show will say, hey, Majestic, Schoenfeld, Lyceum, we want to bring Oh Mary, Cola Scola's play that just had fantastic reviews off Broadway, sold out run, people begging to get tickets. We want to bring it to your theater. We want to do it either for a limited run or an open-ended run. Both those things are going to be different. If it's a limited run, the Lyceum can, let's say it's the Lyceum goes, okay, we're going to offer you this much money to fill it because we don't have a show coming in until... October. So we have these five months that we're going to sit empty that nobody like that. We're not making money because they don't make money unless tickets are being sold there. So it's sitting empty. So theaters don't like to sit empty. So an off Broadway producer will look at it and say, can this make the transition? And then a lot of times theaters, especially if it's a very successful off Broadway run, theaters will say, yes, we want it. We think it'll transition. Well, sometimes it does. Uh, in the event of appropriate, it started off Broadway, it transitioned to Broadway, it's doing phenomenally. Um, sometimes it doesn't do well. Sometimes shows what makes them work is being in that intimate setting. And sometimes producers get real, real excited and go, oh, oh my God, this is, this is going to be knock down, bang out, drag out, great show. A great example of this that I'm very worried they're going to try and do, Teeth, the musical, based on the movie Teeth which for it's about the it's the movie about the vagina with teeth the horror film it is in fact a musical it is currently running off broadway it is currently open ended open ended meaning there's no set date a limited run sets the open sets the close boom that's how long it's going to run the theater knows the theater can then say great we'll pay you at, you will charge you this much a week to be in our theater and you're good to go. If it's open-ended, you then fill out a contract that basically will say, if you don't make X amount of money, we can make the decision to close you because you're not making enough money for us to run. You're, you're hemorrhaging money. We think we can get something more profitable in here. So we're going to cut you out, which is what happened to Beetlejuice when it was at the Winter Garden. The Winter Garden said, you're not making us money. Music Man wants to come in here with Hugh Jackman and Sutton Foster. This is going to sell out and we know it is. So we're going to kick you out of the theater which that does happen quite a bit as well. So, so, the, follow, so the follow-up question to S's comp question, because there is yeah. one. Okay. So hold on two seconds. 
Is there an off-Broadway show that should have made its way to Broadway but didn't, in your opinion? Uh, la, la, la. What I would like, and that's the thing, there are things that happen off-Broadway that sometimes don't get a theater for two, three, four years. So I could say this next play now and then it could have a run in three years. And it's like, well, there we go. Yay, Michael. Um, recently, I just saw The Hunt at the St. Anne's Warehouse. Uh, it It's based on the Dutch film about the school teacher in the rural community that gets accused of sexually assaulting a five-year-old. The five-year-old accuses him um, because there's turmoil going at home and she wants so and she offers the teacher a candy and gets a little uncomfortably close. And he's like, this is not appropriate. And so she, like through a series of events, accuses him. And it's this whole like unraveling of this man's life. And the entirety of the set is just like, like a glass house that they act in, act around, etc. I would love to see that go to Broadway because I think it does have a place for a limited run. Um, I think, however, it needs a smaller theater because the intimate space of that show, the intimacy of that show being in a smaller theater was what made it so impactful and incredible. So I think with that, they need to option smaller Broadway houses. So like the, the Hayes Theater, which I think has exactly 500 and like three seats or something very, very small. Uh, it's the smallest theater on Broadway. It just barely squeaks into the classification of an on-Broadway theater. Um, I would have said O'Mary, but O'Mary is currently transferring. So that one is, I'm very excited for. Um, but kind of on the flip side, a show like Titanic, the Titanic parody musical, I think if it goes to a bigger Broadway house and goes actually to Broadway, it's gonna flop, it's gonna be terrible and it's gonna get garbage reviews. It's a parody of the musical Titanic told through the music of Celine Dion while being narrated by Celine Dion because she was on the Titanic. It's stupid, it's funny. The ending, it becomes a sing-along of uh, my heart will go on. And uh, right before she says, just initiates the sing-along, she says, please everyone in this theater sing along. And I know you all know the words because you're all gay. Like it knows what its demographic is. It is for the girls, the gays and the bays. Um, awesome. That should never transfer. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, and now our second question comes from Timothy. Tim Timothy, uh, hopefully Timothy is... There's a there's a just a T I M O H Y. So hopefully I'm pronouncing it right. Hopefully it's just an autocorrect, but I'm assuming it's Timothy. Um, the question goes: You talked about stunt casting of Pamela Anderson in a past episode. What is the benefits? What is the benefits of actors taking on these types of roles? And is there any benefits to their careers? Do you think? Yeah. Um, first of all marketing all along your show's not doing well what do people want to see ryan reynolds tap dancing on stage so who do we try and cast then in the show that's failing ryan reynolds or like bad cinderella for a while was rumored to be floating around the idea of trisha paytas as one of the stepsisters in it like it's it's a name a celebrity name you know that doesn't usually do broadway um, with Chicago, they do it all the time. That's basically how that show stays afloat. You wait for the celebrity that you want to do it, and then you go see it. Um, but you'll see things, some now with Broadway names kind of becoming bigger. Uh, the Great Gatsby is a good example of this. That musical was mediocre at best. However, you put in Broadway royalty, Jeremy Jordan, Broadway royalty, Abel Noblezada, it becomes brilliant. And, and now all, we all need to see it because listen to their voices. They're so brilliant. Yes, they're brilliant. The material's still weak. However, actors should want to do Broadway. And now uh, Emma Stone, had Emma Stone did Cabaret in uh, 2015. Emma Stone. Who? Who? Emily Stone. There you go. I'm like, are you trying to be funny? And then I was, I was like, oh, I get it. Um, she was... Sally Bowles in Cabaret for about eight, nine months. She said it's the hardest thing she's ever done in her career, but it was the best thing for her career. You are performing eight nights a week doing a show. You, If you screw up a line or if someone screws up a line, you better hope you can save yourself. If, and there, cause there's no going, hold on, pause, cut, cut the film. Let's re, let's run that back. Let's redo it. Like that's why a lot of the times the strongest actors you see in movies 
are the ones who have done Broadway because it's hard creating a character and being able to walk on stage eight times a week. And if your name is above the title and you say, and you like say, I'm not feeling it, I feel sick today and I call out, that theater has to give back the money to every single ticket holder if they want it. If so, if a celebrity's name, if a uh, performer's name is above the title, like I just saw Cabaret, Eddie Redmayne's name is above the title. If he was out, I could go say, hi, I would like my money back. Eddie Redmayne's not here. Thank you. Can you still watch the show? Depends on when you ask. Um, most times, no. Uh, but it's still, it's like a lot of times people only want to come see that celebrity. If your name's above the title and you decide to dip out, Jennifer Hudson in The Color Purple, when I saw it, she was above the title with Danielle Brooks. If one of them was out and I was being like, well, fuck, I came here to see them, I could go get my money back. So can I ask um, a question off of sure. off of sort of spawning off of what Tim Timothy hopefully again I'm just going to call you Tim Timothy I apologize send me your emails if you want is has there ever been a bad stunt casting in your opinion where you've seen yes. that you went, what the hell did they do that for I didn't see this I've seen bootlegs and clips Cameron Dallas in Mean Girls the musical God fucking awful. He was a TikTok star. I don't know why we made this decision. We were like, we're gonna get the we're gonna get the youth to come see the Mean Girls musical. Um, terrible decision. Very terrible decision. Um, I'm trying to think back on bad stunt casting that I've physically seen, though. A lot of times, if I think the stunt casting is shit, I'm not gonna pay the five hundred dollars a ticket price to go see the shit stunt casting. Um, but. Uh, a lot of times off Broadway now they try and do some of that stunt casting. Uh, Jessica Chastain was in a doll's house that I really loved last May. Um, and it's just, it's interesting why they make that decision, why they don't. Um, some shows only work because of stunt casting and only are profitable because of it, because they're just not popular shows that unless you have a big name attached, who's who wants to go see it? Like, I love Little Shop of Horrors. It's an incredible show. You've seen Little Shop once, you don't really need to see it again. It's not like Chicago or Wicked or something like that. It doesn't necessarily have the big spectacle moments or the incredible dance numbers. But do I want to go see Jinx Monsoon be that role? 100%. Do I want to go see uh, Lena Hall, Matt Doyle, who are big Broadway names, go do that? Absolutely. Do I want to see Corbin Blue of High School Musical go do that role? Absolutely. Like, there's things like that that when you start throwing names around like that with regards to a show, it sometimes makes the show great. Sometimes it makes the show shit if it's a bad stunt cast. But I, I'm i going to knock on wood and say I've yet to see a really... Oh, no, I... Fuck, I just bit myself in the tongue. Grant Gustin in Water for Elephants is kind of mediocre. Wow. Uh, I just saw it this weekend and he was fine. But. He maybe needed to focus on, there's something that's not clicking there for him. And it might be the fact that it's eight performances a week. That's a lot on anybody. He's not above the title. So he actually can call out sick without costing the theater money. But it's just a lot of, um, uh, it's a lot. Eight shows is a lot, especially a vocally demanding show and a dance demanding show. So something is suffering and it might be he needs to implement cardio. It might be he maybe shouldn't focus on doing a musical first and maybe should do something like a play first to work on the acting. No, it's a real I, thing. I like how you said he needs to do cardio to the guy who literally played the fastest man in the world. Oh, no, but that I, so I listened to an interview where Amber Riley during Dream Girl, she was F.E. White in the UK. <laughs> and she said she has to, when she does any kind of theater, theater, either West End, Broadway, whatever, she has to run on the treadmill an hour to two, or at least move on the treadmill, run, walk something, at least an hour to two every single day to keep up the cardio because of the singing and the dancing demand while acting, while all these moving pieces are clicking into place. It's tiring. It's re I did, I'll do a four show weekend sometimes, or a five, I'm doing a five show weekend or a five show run for my version of cabaret that I'm about to step into. And I'm already exhausted. After three performances, half the time, I'm ready to call it quits and go to sleep. 
five, I'm going to be wiped. It's, it's just, there's so many, it's, it's intense. Cause you're, you're not getting to say cut and go take a break like with filming. So it does sometimes behoove an actor who wants to work on their craft and get stronger to go do something on Broadway. Um, Robert Downey Jr. is actually stepping into a play this fall. And it's going to be his Broadway debut. Uh, it's this play about a teacher. So is he going for the, t- is he going for the EGOT now? Uh, possibly. I think he might just want to do Broadway. Yeah, Possibly do a complete 180 of what he was doing prior so yeah he's doing the play mcneil okay it's a new it's a new um play it's running for literally it's september 30th it's september 5th previews begin september 30th it officially opens and then november 24th it ends and it like does not have a oh we could maybe extend it because sometimes with limited runs they'll extend it if it's selling well um they just did that with mother play starring rachel mcadams uh but with this, it is strictly limited, which usually means they're not going to extend it. They, the theater has something else coming into that space pretty abruptly, and they need to move that stuff out. Yeah, maybe he'll get a he'll get a Tony nod for it. Anyway, keep your questions coming in because that was fun. That's a new segment on the show: questions with Michael about the theater industry. Uh, I no, do love not that. that, Michael. Always a pleasure to sit down with you. Before we go, I have one last thing to ask you because I can't believe we've gone an hour and fifteen minutes without you mentioning the fact that you went to the theater and you got to see the theater with a very special theater guest in the audience at the exact same time. Patty Lapone. Yep. How was that? Patty! It was wild. I literally was in the, like, we're on the orchestra. We're, we're in orchestra seating. So we're in, and we're in the last row of the orchestra seating. My husband and I are chatting, la, 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 la. I look up from my program, and who do I spot directly down by, like, row five? Miss Patty Lapone's Bob. I didn't even see her face. I saw her Bob. And I turned to Jonathan, and I go, that's Patty Lapone. He goes, excuse me? And I go, that's Patty Lapone's Bob. I know that Bob anywhere. That Bob should be insured. I know that Bob anywhere. And then she turned around and you got Patty. And Jonathan and I went, oh, it is in fact Patty. And then the ushers were like, yeah, it's Patty's here. Blah, blah, blah. Because we're chatting with the ushers. We're having a good time as we usually do. And they were like, yeah, that's Patty. She was super nice. I'm like, oh my God, I want to go see her. But like, I don't want to get yelled at her. And then my husband goes, or do you want to get yelled at her? Because that's very iconic. And I'm like, <laughs> Wait, no, you're right. I kind of do also want to get yelled at by Patty. I want to both have a wonderful interaction, but I also want to have an interaction where she screams at me. What do I do? And he goes, you should just go say hi. And I go, you know what? I don't need to. I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to admire Patty from afar. Good times. It sounds like you had an interesting experience in uh, in New York City over the last few weeks. Uh, Michael, it's always a pleasure to sit down with you and talk about the entertainment industry as not the people you were thinking about because we have no likeness. We have no commercial benefit to their likeness or their livelihoods. So the this I have been Chris Brown. He has been Mike Nichols. And this has been No Not Them. Michael, always a pleasure. Bye.